Hello there, welcome back for more animals. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the protostomes. So by the end of this chapter, you should be able to define the protostomes and explain why they're ecologically and evolutionarily important. You should be able to discuss the major characteristics that differentiate the group of protostomes called Lophotrochozoa and the Ecdysozoa. You should be able to describe characteristics of the major Lophotrochozoan phyla like Platyhelminthes, Annelida, and Mollusca. And you should be able to describe the characteristics of the major, major ectysozoan phyla, nematoda, and arthropoda. All right, so protostome animals are diverse and very abundant. Um, so we are talking about 30 animal phyla, a little bit, at least, in this class, and 22 of them are protostomes. So there are some protostome phyla that have very little diversity, um, the priapulins, um, we're given that name because the people who found them thought they looked weird and penis-like. There are only 16 priapulins. There are, however, over 85,000 mollusks that have been named, and 1.2 million arth arthropod species that have been named, and 1 million of those are insects. And you know people love insects, right? Because they're everywhere we live. Um, but if you actually try and look for arthropods in the places where arthropods live, like the ocean, for example, the actual number of arthropod species may be over 10 million. So researchers are in agreement that the first lineages of, an of animals um, were probably sponges, phylum periphera, comb jellies, phylum tenophora, and jellies and corals, phylum cnidaria. You may remember there's some debate about exactly which one was first. Um, so the ancestor of the bilaterians probably was, like the bilaterians, bilaterally symmetrical and triploblastic. And so we think that that ancestral population gave rise to um, the diversity of all the different kinds of bilaterian body plans that first appeared during the Cambrian explosion. So when I was in school, there was this idea that you could tell a protostome from a deuterostome by its specific developmental characteristics. So the first one was whether the blastopore became a mouth or an anus. So, does anyone remember what the blastopore is? Yeah, I remember. It's like when you have a ball of cells and it gets a little dimple in one side, and then that's either going to become the mouth or the anus. Yeah. That's the first thing. The second characteristic was whether an isolated embryonic cell could develop into an embryo. So, if you were to pull one cell out of the ball of cells and get it to grow on its own, in some phyla, that will grow into a new embryo, and some phyla it will not. The third characteristic was how the coelom forms from mesodermal cells. Um, so in some groups it kind of formed um, from dividing, in other groups it formed from blocks. But you know what? You don't have to know any of that stuff, because we now realize that these kind of distinctions that we used to say don't actually like reliably tell us the difference between a protostome and a deuterostome. So we know that in deuterostomes, um, the anus develops before the mouth, but also it sometimes does in protostomes as well. Um, we know that there are similar developmental characteristics that evolve independently in different lineages. So even though they look similar, they are not homologous traits. And we have some groups that don't have traits that we used to consider to be synapomorphies of the larger group. Okay. So what we use now to divide up the protostomes um, are this um, more recent grouping based on DNA sequence data. So this data reveals that there are two groups, the Lophotrochozoa, which includes rot rotifers, uh, platyhelminthes flatworms, annelids, and mollusks, and the Ecdysozoa, which includes nematodes, tardigrades, onychophora, which are like the velvet worms, and arthropods. All right, what are the two groups of protostomes? Ectoisozoa. Yeah. What's the other one? Pro. Well, Lofa Tofa Tofa. Sofa Nofa. Trofa Kofa? No. Lofa. Lofa Foro. Lofa Foro. Lofa Foro Nine? No. Lofa Trocozoa. Lofa Trocozoa. Okay. So, um, looking at the fossil evidence, there um, is reason to believe that the protostome lineage started out in the ocean 
um, and then transitioned from aquatic to terrestrial environments. But it didn't just happen one time. We think that this transition happened multiple times in different lineages. So all of the blue lines represent aquatic uh, lineages that are all aquatic, like the echinoderms or the cnidarians. The green ones are all terrestrial. And then the rest of them are, have some terrestrial members and some aquatic members. Um, so it seems clear that this is a big messy tree and probably this happened, um, the, the transition from water to land happened many times. Okay, so protosomes have adaptations to land and different groups have different adaptations. So for example, you have some kinds of protosomes that live in very moist environments and so these guys can have a high surface to volume ratio in order to, uh, to increase the amount of gas that they can exchange through their skin. So roundworms and earthworms have this kind of a plan going on. Actually, so do flatworms, but more about that later. Um, let's see, so some protosomes have internal gills that help them minimize water loss. So for example, mollusks have kind of a little chamber that they keep their gills in, and if you seal off that chamber just to a little hole, it basically makes a lung. So that is what snails and slugs will often do. Insects will have a waxy layer of cuticular hydrocarbons that keep them from drying out. In several lineages, um, desiccation-resistant eggs have evolved. So in insects, the eggs will have this really thick membrane to keep, it, uh, to keep all the moisture in, and then snails and slugs have a shell on their eggs that keep water in. Okay, so animals, all the animals, have a common toolkit of genes that um, help control the body plan during development. So, do you remember Hox genes? Anyone? Yeah, I remember Hox genes. What do you remember about them? Like, the Hox gene says where your head is and where your butt is. Yeah, exactly. So the Hox gene directs um, what gene product should be expressed um, on what part of your body so that your your proteins that are going to make up your head get in the head's part of your body and the ones that make your butt will be in the butt part of your body, right? Um, so if you have a minor change to a Hox gene, it can cause a major difference to the body. You could have two butts! Uh, sure, you could have two butts. So the body plan of animals could potentially change very quickly by just changing the expression of the existing genes you know, by messing with them, by um, changing the Hox genes. And so animals have genetically based modularity, right? So a module is like a small unit, right? A repeated unit. And so you can have a small set of elements that are reused and rearranged to produce a large variety of different kinds of outcomes. So for example, if this is what the ancestral um, species looks like, you could use your Hox genes or other master controller genes um, to duplicate some functions. So for example, you could increase expression over here and end up with double antennae or a double set of eyes, um, or have you know increased expression of the middle part here, which gives you multiple modules, um, so it gives you more and more legs, or something about the way that it's being expressed could increase the size of this unit relative to the other units. Right? So each of these modules can be tweaked by how the, how the Hox genes are expressed, and that can give you a variety of different body forms. All right, let's talk about the Lophotrochozoa. So they are a monophyletic group. There are 13 phyla in the Lophotrochozoa, including, and we're not going to talk about all 13, but we're just going to talk about a representative couple. And so that we are, we'll talk about the rotifers, the flatworms, the annelids, and the mollusks. And so there are two morphological traits that occur in some but not all members of the Lophotrochozoa. The first one is the Lophophore. So this is what this is a picture of over here. And it is a specialized feeding structure that allows Lophotrochozoa to be suspension feeders. So it kind of comes out over here and it curls around. Sometimes it even curls into a little curly cue on each side. And three phyla of the Lophotrochozoa have this Lophophore feeding structure. Um, many of the Lophotrochozoans have trochophore larvae. So again, there's lots of different kinds of larvae, right? So other groups besides Lophotrochozoa have larvae, but only Lophotrochozoans have this weird trochophore larvae that looks like this. So it's kind of this weird shaped um, body with a dumb looking flagella on the top and the bottom, and then the ring of cilia around the middle, okay? 
Um, so yeah, so that's a, a, a synapomorphy for the Lofotrochozoans. And then finally, um, oh, I should point out here that, that the Lophotrochozoa larvae are found in many different Lophotrochozoans, so we think that they evolved pretty early on in the history of Lophotrochozoa. Um, and in some groups, it kind of got morphed around into being, you know, structurally different, so it's become a different larval type. Uh, and also to point out that, that there's plenty of other groups that have larvae besides the Lophotrochozoans, but they just don't have these trochophore larvae. All right, the third characteristics of the Lophotrochozoans are, is called spiral cleavage. And so, all right, so here you have a fertilized egg and it divides and it divides. So now you have four cells and then it divides again. So now you have eight cells. So the eight cells could either be stacked directly on top of each other or kind of spiraled around each other like this. And then divide again, they could be spiraled again or on top again. So if they are spiraled like this, this is called spiral cleavage. If they're directly on top of each other, that's radial cleavage, okay? So spiral cleavage in embryos is a synapomorphy for locotrochozoans. So an animal is definitely a lophotrochozoa if it has a lophophore, a trochophore larvae, or spiral cleavage. Um, but not all lophotrochozoans have all three things, so you don't have to have all three. Okay, do you remember what a tube within a tube design referred to? So we talked about how lots of organisms are basically a tube within a tube. So the outside tube is derived from what? Ectoderm! Yeah, so what's that become? Oh, like the skin and the nervous system. Yeah? And what's the inside tube derived from? This derived from endoderm! And what does that become? That becomes your guts! Yeah? And then the tissue between the two, two, the two tubes is derived from what? Mesoderm. Yeah, and what's that become? All your organs and gooey stuff. Okay. Um, so lots of Lophotrochozoan phyla have species with long, thin, tube-like bodies without any limbs. And they're basically just your classic worm who is a tube within a tube. Those worms might or might not have a coelom depending on the group. All right, so what are the three characteristics of a Lophotrochozoan? <coughs> trochophore larvae. Yeah, trochophore larvae. Spiral cleavage. Yeah. And what else? Lophophophophoph. What? Trochophophophoph. What? Lo lophophore. Yeah, lophophore. All right, so let's get into our first phylum of Lophotrochozoas. So this is Platyhelminthes, the flatworm. So it has a broad, flat body. What is that? It's a flatworm, a Platyhelminthes. I don't like it. Well, you don't have to like it. It just is. We know that flatworms are Lophotrochozoa based on molecular data. They have no coelom. So um, they're acelomates. They're just a solid chunk of worm. They don't have any structures for gas exchange or circulation of oxygen and nutrients. They just kind of are absorbing it through the body. Um, so the body, is, the, the body being so flat and skinny is an adaptation to allow them for lots of surface area for gas exchange and also saves them from having to make all these internal structures to do that. But the trade-off is that they have to live somewhere aquatic or moist or they would dry out. So there are four major lineages of flatworms. And the first one we'll call Turbillaria. Um, this is kind of an older name for a group of flatworms. Uh, we no longer think that Turbillaria is a monophyletic group. We, in fact, know that it is a paraphyletic group. Um, so some of them are hunters, like this one up at the top here. Um, some of them are free living. Um, some of them are scavengers. They have a blind digestive tract, meaning that they have mouth, and that is at the end of pharynx. And they can use that to extend out and pierce food. The mouth is often not on the head, but on the underside of the body. Um, and whatever waste has to come back out of that mouth again, because they don't have an anus. The second lineage are the trematodes. So these are um, either, these are called flukes. They're either endoparasitic or ectoparasitic, meaning inside the body or outside of the body. Uh, they parasitize vertebrates and arthropods and annelids and mollusks and one Luke is responsible for the disease schistosomiasis, which infects more than 200 million people worldwide. Um, and so flukes can, as they are in the body gulping host tissues and fluids, they can cause blood in the host's urine or kidney, 
or um, or even uh, sorry, they can cause blood in the host urine or in their stool, um, and they can actually cause kidney failure. So the consequences are are pretty serious. All right, the third lineage are the cestodes. These are the grossest ones. So these are endoparasitic tapeworms. Oh, dogs get tapeworms. Yeah, dogs get tapeworms. But people used to get tapeworms all the time. They basically attach in the gut, and they don't have any digestive organs. Instead, they just like they're just bathed in food, um, and they just absorb food through their body wall. Um, so people who you know, acquire tapeworms um, will often get kind of thin because they're not absorbing all the food in their body. Um, and you can acquire them by eating undercooked pork, beef, or fish. Um, and then the fourth group of flatworms you've probably never heard of before, they're called monogenea. And they're these tiny little lactoparasites that tend to um, parasitize particular tissues of particular species. So this picture here is a picture of one that parasit parasitizes the gills of fishes. All right, now we're going to move on from phylum Pallidae helminthes to phylum Annelida, the segmented worms. So annelids have a coelom. They have a fully developed digestive tract, meaning they got a mouth at one end and an anus at another end, and their body is composed of segments. So when I was in school, we used to think that annelids and arthropods were sister groups because they're both segmented. Um, so what we know now is that the segmentation arose independently in each of these lineages. So um, we know that both phyla use the same developmental toolkit genes for segmentation. So the genes are homologous, but they use those genes in different ways in each lineage. So there is convergent evolution um, or analogy at the morphological level. Okay, so one um, synapomorphy of the segmented worms are these kind of like lobe-like parapodia that have chiti, which are these bristle-like extensions. And so we know that the, the DLL genes um, that we see expressed in the limbs of insects are also expressed in the parapodia. And so we think that there's a homology at the genetic level, even though parapodia with chidae look nothing like the legs of many insects. Okay, so how are segments in annelids and arthropods homologous? Oh, the, the toolkit genes are the same. Yeah. And they look a little bit alike. They do look a little bit alike, but that doesn't mean they're homologous. No, I guess not. So how are the segments in annelids and arthropods not homologous? Well, they use the genes differently to make different structures, so, like, that's how they're, they're not homologous. Is there another word you know for not homologous? Like, analogous, or homoplastic, or, or convergent evolution. Yep. All right, so the second group of annelids are the polychaetes. So polychaetes live in marine environments. Some of them live on the ocean bottom. Some of them um, are really good swimmers with these long parapodia and chidae. Um, there's some that, that kind of crawl around on the floor, hunt stuff. All right, uh, the next group of um, annelids are the oligochaetes. These are the earthworms. So they are deposit feeders in soil, and they do all sorts of ecosystem services, like they aerate, aerate soil with tunnels, and then as they poop, the feces contribute large amounts to the organic matter in the soil. And then the third group are the herodinia, which are the leeches, and these are ectoparasites of fish and humans, and hosts, and so they kind of latch on suck blood and bodily fluids. But there are non-parasitic leaf species, leaf, leech species, that are predators scavengers. So if you look at the leech, one thing you can see is that um, even though internally they don't necessarily have a degree of segmentation that you see in an oligochaete or a polychaete, um, they still have all the lines on the outside that kind of let you know that they're related to the oligochaetes and polychaetes. Um, we used to think that there was a phylum, well, there was a phylum called Sepunculida Sepuncul and a phylum called Echiura, and we used to think that those were independent phyla. Um, and so both of those, so this top picture is a sepunculid, and the bottom one is subecurians. Um, so you can see they have no segments. But we know now that sepunculids and echiura are actually polychaetes. And so in both of these lineages, the ancestors were segmented, but then the segmentation was lost over time. So because of that, we now know that the polychaetes are paraphyletic. 
Um, although I suppose if you want to consider the sepunculids and the ectiurans to be polychaetes, then I guess then I guess polychaetes aren't paraphyletic anymore. All right. So how are flatworms and segmented worms similar? They both long and skinny. They're long and skinny. Okay. They have a high surface to volume ratio because they're long and skinny. Yeah, that's true. Um, what else? They gotta live in wet places. Yeah, that's true. So how are flatworms and segmented worms different? Well, the segmented worms got segments and the flatworms got no segments. Yeah. What else? Well, the segmented worms are coelomates, but the flatworms have no coelom in them. Yeah, that's true. Um, anything else? The flatworms don't have an anus. Yeah, the flatworms don't have an anus. Alright, here's a game called Segmented or Flatworm. You ready for it? What do we do? I show you something and you tell me, is it a segmented worm or a flatworm? Oh, I can do that. Alright, you ready? Yes! Oligokita. That's a, that's a segmented worm, it's an earthworm. Trematode. Flatworm. Polychaeta. Segmented worm. Monogenea. That's a flatworm. Cestoda. Flatworm. Hirudinia. Oh, that's a segmented worm. Turbularia. Flatworm. All right, on to the mollusks. Um, phylum mollusca. So mollusks are a monophyletic group, and they have a body plan that has three basic components that are kind of tweaked and adjusted in each, each of the different lineages. Um, so they have a foot, which is down here on the bottom. It's a large muscle used in movement. They have a visceral mass, which is a big hump of flesh that contains the internal organs and the external gill. And they have a mantle, which is, you can see that kind of purple line there, that covers the visceral mass, which forms an enclosure called the mantle cavity. And sometimes that mantle will secrete a shell if it's, um, you know, if it's a mollusk with a shell. So there are four kinds of mollusks, the chitons, polyplacophora, bivalves, bivalvia, gastropods, slugs and snails, and the cephalopods, squid and octopuses. All right, what are the three parts of the mollusk body? Visceral mass. Okay, you like that one, huh? Oh yeah. What else? Mantle! Yeah, mantle. And then what's the third part? The foot! Yeah, the foot. What are the four groups of mollusks? Gastropods! Yeah, gastropods. What else? Bivalves. Yeah? Chitons! Yeah, chitons. What's the third kind? Or the fourth kind? Oh, that's the cephalopods! Yep. All right, so the snails and the chitons have a large muscular foot they use to stick to surfaces, and um, they're able to use these waves of contraction to sweep forward or backward along the length of the foot. So you can see those kind of striped lines on the foot of that snail there. Um, and those muscles are flexing against the kind of fluid inside the foot to be able to kind of scrunch around in the ground. In bivalves, the foot has been modified to be a digging appendage what is that guy doing? Well, he's trying to dig back into the soil, but there's no soil, so he's just kind of sticking his foot out and looking around for soil. Um, in cephalopods, the foot is modified to form tentacles for crawling and grasping. Okay, um, so the visceral mass um, makes it so that you have all the organs in one convenient place, and that is separate from the hydrostatic skeleton um, of the foot that does the moving. Okay, so the organs and surrounding fluids are in the visceral mass uh, and the foot somewhere else. And so this allows the visceral mass, mass and the foot to diversify separately from one another. Um, so you would say that mollusks are coelomates, but their coelom is very, very reduced. It's almost impossible to see it. Um, it is only used for reproduction and waste excretion. But if you were to dissect a mollusk, you would see that they do have a different body cavity called a hemocele. So mollusks have an open circulatory system. It means they have kind of an area where all of the blood squishes around and that squishing allows, you know, oxygenation to happen and 
materials to be passed from one place to another. That would be different than something like an analigachete or an analid. They have a closed circulatory system where all of their blood is like in plumbing. Um, I should point out that the hemocele, where mollusks use to keep their blood, is not a coelom because um, we know that if you track the cellular development of the hemocele, it doesn't come from the mesoderm and it develops from an entirely different um, set of cells in the body. <coughs> so mollusks have a feeding structure called a radula. It's a little scrapey thing and they use it to rasp back and forth over the food and break off food pieces. So if you ever see like a snail scraping along a glass wall, that's what it's doing. Um, you don't see a radula in bivalves. They are suspension feeders, so they have lost their radula. So the mantle might secrete a shell if, if it's a mollusk with a shell. The shell is made of calcium carbonate, which is protective but really heavy. So some species have one, two, or eight valves, and some have no shells. In bivalves, they have two shells, which are connected by a hinge and can close up. And the shell always represents a trade-off between protection and mobility. So if you're a mollusk with a really thick shell, you have to stay in an aquatic habitat to be able to support the weight of the shell, right? Um, the largest mollusks have very reduced shells or no shells because it's just too hard to carry something so heavy around with you. Um, mollusks that are on land tend to have very thin shells or no shells for the same reason. So the mantle can be used to do different things. So in terrestrial snails, the mantle will form an internal lung. So it'll seal up um, so that there's only a tiny little hole and they won't lose too much water when they breathe. In bivalves and cephalopods, the mantle is lined with muscle and forms tubes called siphons. So like in this picture of a squid here, um, it is pulling water underneath the mantle and then shooting it out of the siphon. And it can turn the siphon in different directions to be able to direct which way it's going in. Um, so it kind of uses jet propulsion. And this is one reason why um, some cephalopods, like a squid, are super fast. So you can see here two modifications of a foot. And so um, you can see on this clam here, it's digging down into the ground and it's kind of spitting the dirt out through its excrement siphon and it's sucking air or water in through its current siphon. And then over here on the right, you can see this baby squid uh, pulling water and um, uh, underneath its middle nose shooting out the water. Okay, so let's say you were scuba diving one day. Like they let a dog scuba dive. Well, who's going to stop you? Yeah, okay. So you're scuba diving one day and you observe an animal with a broad muscular foot crawling along the ocean floor scraping algae off rocks with a radula. The animal has a protective shell comprised of a series of plates. What have you found? It's not a cephalopod. Because they, that's not how they do. Right, okay. What else? It's not a gastropod because they only got the one shell. Yeah? Could it be a bivalve? No, they, they wouldn't have a radula. They lost a radula. Alright, what about a crustacean? They, they don't have a radula. Alright, so what is it? It's a polyplacophore. Yeah, a polyplacophore, a chitin. All right, let's move down to the move on to the ecdysozoa. So the ecdysozoa name comes from the fact that they are shedding, okay? Um, so they grow by molting. They shed the soft cuticle or hard exoskeleton on their bodies. Um, so a lophotrochozoan, so you see this top picture of a, of a clam, right? It has little rings. Every year that it lives, it grows a little bit bigger and has a little bit of a bigger ring. So it can grow continuously in little, little bursts throughout its life. However, in an ecdysozoan, they um, basically stay the same size, and the only way they can get bigger is to molt. So after they molt, the fluid expands the body, and they can expand their body larger, and then um, they will form a larger cuticle or exoskeleton after their, their outer coating hardens. So the cuticle and the exoskeleton are protective, and also play uh, a role in muscle attachment. So the muscles are attached on the inside of this exoskeleton. But during molting, the animal is very exposed to predation. All right, the first ecdysozoan we're going to talk about are the roundworms. Um, so this is phylum nematoda. That's the roundworms. They are unsegmented. They have a pseudocelum. Do you remember what a pseudocelum is? Anyone? Yeah, it's like 
It's the hole, but it's not surrounded by mesoderm. Yeah, hole not surrounded by mesoderm. What is it surrounded by? Oh, I know. It's it's like a mesoderm on the one side and a endoderm on the other side. Yeah. It has an elastic cuticle on the outside that is molted. They don't have any kind of specialized system for exchanging gases and circulating nutrients because they're really little. Um, so the nutrients will move by diffusion from the gut to the other parts of the body. Um, so they, they eat food and poop it out the other side and then um, the nutrients just kind of diffuse around the inside of the body. They eat bacteria and archaea, fungi, plant roots, protists, and detritus. Some of them are free living and some of them parasitize animals, including humans. So if you've ever had a dog who had roundworms, um, that's what those are. All right, next, tardigrades and velvet worms. Um, so these are closely related phyla to the arthropods. They have segmented body and um, limbs like an arthropod, but they're not hard and crusty. Instead, they got soft, squishy legs. Their limbs are not jointed either. So here's a tardigrade, kind of adorable. Um, so you can see it has soft, squishy limbs not hard or jointed. And they live in water or moist terrestrial environments. And this is a, a velvet worm or an onychophora. They live in leaf litter and prey on small invertebrates. We have tardigrades everywhere around here, although they're microscopic. I don't believe they have onychophorans in Ohio, though. I don't think they're in there. Okay, now we're on to the arthropods. So arthropods appear in the fossil record over 520 million years ago. And so we think of them as the most important phylum within the ecdysozoa because they have been in the fossil record for such a long time. They have such high species diversity and there are so many of them. Um, so they're abundant in aquatic and terrestrial environments and over a million living species have been described. So they have three key features. The first is a segmented body. And so the body is organized into morphological units called tagmata. Um, so, for example, an insect has three tag, well, Insects have three tagmata, um, so they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Spiders have two tagmata, an abdomen, and a cephalothorax. Um, the second feature is the exoskeleton. So if you remember from 1113, chitin is a polysaccharide, right? And in some groups, like crustaceans, the chitin is further strengthened by calcium carbonate. Um, the third feature is that they have jointed appendages, and this is where the name arthropod comes from, it just means like jointed foot. And so the joints are what allow them to move the rigid body so they don't just walk around all stiff-legged. Okay, so um, like mollusks, arthropod bodies are modular, so they have different units. And so if you just make small changes to Hox genes, you can duplicate things. So for example, you can go from having four, four sets of legs to five sets of legs, or having small swimmers to big swimmers in the back. Um, so just a little tweak to the Hox genes can result in novel shapes and sizes, um, you know, while still retaining all of the other structures. So um, the idea behind why we think the arthropod body plan has been so successful is a combination of variation in gene expression and eco ecological opportunity. So the ability to make little tweaks to the Hox genes that allow new modules to appear, um, if those little, you know, getting extra swimmerettes or an extra set of legs helps that individual to survive and have more babies, then those traits will spread. Obviously, if you make an extra module and it makes the animal poorly fit for its environment, then it'll die. But just the combination of having the ability to um, change body plan by gene expression and then sort it by natural selection um, has allowed the arthropods to diversify. So insects were the first animals on earth with wings. So it must have been awesome when the first insect got up off the ground and there was nothing to chase it. Um, there are two hypotheses about wings, where they came from in the insect. The first is an independent origin hypothesis. Um, independent meaning independent of the legs, so, um, just so there was a completely separate outpouching of the thorax that became the wing. And then the second hypothesis is the gill co-option hypothesis. And so in a lot of arthropods, you see that the legs have these little kind of gill supports on them. And so the thought was that maybe the little gill supports would grow into becoming a wing. Um, and we think that um, based on uh, some hypothesis testing using developmental genetics, that the gill co-option hypothesis is more strongly supported. 
Okay, so arthropod diversity. Um, there are four major lineages, myriapods, insects, crustaceans, and chelicerates. So myriapods, like these two over here, have um, a myriapod means many feet. They have a head region and then a long trunk with segments, and so they either have one pair of legs per segment, and that would be a centipede, like the one on the top, or two pairs of legs per segment, and that's a millipede. Some species have no eyes, but others have a few or many simple eyes on the sides of the head. Um, so like um, centipedes, right, usually active hunters, so they're quite fast. So if you have a house like this top one in your home, it probably means that you have, you know, little silverfish or other things that have gotten into your home and it's come to eat them. Um, a millipede is kind of a burrower. It eats detritus off of the ground. And so it's kind of uses its <clears throat> powerful legs and budding head to be able to push underneath the dirt. And so they're both terrestrial groups and you find them all over the world. Uh, the next group are the insects. So their main thing is that they have three tagmata. Their appendages are unbranched and they have one pair of antennae. So that distinguishes them from the other kinds of arthropods. Uh, so their head has four pairs of mouth part structures, one pair of antennae and a pair of compound eyes. Their thorax has three pairs of walking legs. And most insects have either one or two pairs of wings. And an abdomen, which contains the reproductive, respiratory, and digestive organs. So, like I said before, there's more than a million named insect species. Um, in terrestrial environments, insects dominate, and also in freshwater aquatic environments, insect larvae can be a common ecological component of those environments. All right, so crustaceans are the second kind of arthrop arthropod. They have two to three tagmata and branched appendages and two pairs of antennae, okay? So they're primarily aquatic, although a few species are terrestrial, like your little pill bugs or whatever. The crustacean body is, has three tagmata, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And some species have a carapace, or kind of a, like a little turtle shell they wear, that protects their head and thorax. So like I said, crustacean appendages are usually branched. So if you can see in this picture here, on each appendage, it has like, looks like it has four little legs coming out of the spot there. So they have two sets of legs, which each have two branches on them. They have two pairs of antennae. They have sophisticated compound eyes, usually on stalks, and then four to six pairs of mouth parts derived from the jointed appendages. Um, and some of the mouth parts may even be kind of at the base of the legs near the mouth. Yeah, so the mouth parts can be on the head or on the thorax. Um, so the fourth group are the chelicerates. So they have two tagmata and chelicerate. So this includes spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites on land, and then in the water, horseshoe crabs and sea spiders. So they have two tagmata, the cephalothorax and the abdomen, but the cephalothorax and abdomen aren't homologous to the ones that you see in other arthropods. They're, you know, kind of an analogous trait. They have no antennae, but they usually have eyes. Um, so one of the, their main synapomorphia are the chelicerae, which are these claw-like appendages near the mouth. So you can see the guy on the top has blue ones. Um, the white on the bottom has orange ones. I don't think you can see the ones in the harvestmen in the middle. Um, so they're used in feeding, defense, copulation, movement, or sensory reception. And then um, chelicerates will often have pedipalps next after that. So you can see, I don't know, my pointer doesn't work right now, but you can see there's a second set of little legs that don't touch the ground on all of these guys. Those are the pedipalps. And so those are used to handle the food and transfer sperm and stuff like that. All right, what are the four groups of arthropods? Insects! What else? Myriapoda. Myriapoda, what else? Chelicerates. Yeah, chelicerates. And then which one do we get? Oh, crustaceans. Yeah, crustaceans. All right, so people are reconsidering the relationships between the arthropods based on new genetic information. So historically, uh, we have presumed that insects and myriapods were sister groups because they're very morphologically similar. But more recently, we think that the insect clade is actually within the crustacean lineage. Um, and if that's true, then that would mean that the crustaceans are now paraphyletic. All right, a biologist discovered a new species of arthropod. Which of these characteristics would inspire her to determine that it was a crustacean and not an insect? About four pairs of mouth parts. I think that's an insect. Okay, both male and female sex is present. I don't think that tells you anything. Yeah, that's true. Uh, haltiers that stabilize the animal during flight. I think that's like 
flies. I don't think that helps. Yeah. Uh, indirect development? I don't think that helps either. I think you could have indirect development in a crustacean or an insect. What about two pairs of antennae? Oh, that's definitely a crustacean. Like when you're having a lobster dinner and then there's two pairs of antennae, then you know it's a crustacean. Uh, sure. Okay. So, insects have two possible types of metamorphosis. So, um, when they are born, then they hatch, they could either hatch into a little mini grown-up, so the juvenile could just be like a mini adult, and then every time they molt, they get a little bit bigger until they become adult size. So that is a kind of a direct development. development. It's, caused, it's called, well, it's called direct development. It's called hemimetabolous metamorphosis, and it's also called incomplete metamorphosis. I didn't give it three names, it just came like that. All right, the alternative is it could have a distinct larval stage that looks very different from the adult. It could live in a different place from the adult and eat completely different food from the adult. So that is called holometabolous or complete metamorphosis, and that would be indirect development. Um, so, like for example, with this mosquito here, the adult flies around and bites people and the larvae live in water. Um, when the larvae get big enough, they will curl up into this little pupil case and then their body will kind of rearrange itself and remodel itself and they will emerge from the pupil case as an adult mosquito. All right, name two advantages of complete metamorphosis. You don't have to fight over food with your babies. Yeah, why not? Because you just don't eat the same thing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's one advantage. What else? I guess you could specialize on being like um, doing different things at different parts of your life. Yeah, you could be a specialist. Um, so we know that complete metamorphosis is 10 times more common than incomplete metamorphosis. And so we think this could be for one of two reasons. It could be because of feeding efficiency. So adults and juveniles, if they eat different foods, then they're not going to compete for each other with each other. Another hypothesis is based on functional specialization. So, um, for example, you could, as a juvenile, specialize on eating as much food as you possibly can, right? And then as an adult, you might not even eat any food um, and instead just focus on mating. And this happens with many different kinds of insects. All right, let's just remind you what the lineages are. So we talked about different Lophotrochozoans. We talked about rotifers, um, phylum rotifera, Phylum platyhelminthes, the flatworms. We talked about phylum annelida, the segmented worms. We talked about phylum mollusca. Okay, and then within the mollusks, we talked about uh, four classes: um, Polyplacophora, the chitons; Bivalvia, the clams and mussels and oysters; Gastropoda, snails and slugs; and then Cephalopoda, squid, octopus, nautiluses, and cuttlefish. All right, in the ecdysozoans. We talked about the phylum nematoda, the roundworms, uh, phylum tardigrada, the water bears, phylum onycophora, velvet worms, and phylum arthropoda, the arthropods. And then within the arthropods, we talked about four major groups, the myriapoda, millipedes and centipedes, insecta, insects, crustacea, shrimp, lobsters, crabs, barnacles, isopods, copepods, and chelicerata, which are like spiders and mites and horseshoe crabs and scorpions and stuff. So in this chapter, you hopefully learned protostomes are the most diverse and abundant animals on Earth. Um, so you learned what a protostome was, and then you learned what a lophotrochozoan and an ecdysozoan were, and then you looked at different lineages within each group. Does she have caterpillars in her eyebrows? No, it's millipedes. Oh. <laughs>